50 miles above our Earth, a motion picture camera records another in a continuing series of space achievements. Scientific and engineering technologies have made astounding advances at a greatly accelerated rate. High magnification lenses, like the one used to track this Titan missile, are very useful at relatively low altitudes. But at much longer distances, the same lenses are extremely limited in their ability to record usable data. The development of the radar-controlled Rotai camera, with its 500-inch lens and 70-millimeter film, makes it possible to record data at much greater distances. Here through the eyes of the Rotai camera, you see a Titan missile at a distance of 50 miles shed its spent first stage and successfully ignite its second stage. But even the Rotai camera doesn't always produce the necessary data. A need existed for on-the-scene cameras, cameras in space. They weren't long in coming. A hot and humid August day in 1959 finds an Atlas missile standing tall on its launch pad at Cape Canaveral. Atop the shining nine-story giant sits a Mark II warhead carrying a small inanimate passenger, a motion picture camera awaiting its journey into space. This is the first Atlas in a new series of tests undertaken to study the free flight characteristics of the Mark II warhead. A secondary objective is to investigate problem areas associated with the use of cameras in space. Launch time draws near. Countdown reaches the final seconds. At 1600 hours on the 24th of August, the missile takes its leave. A few short minutes later, the camera is turned on. The warhead separates and the booster falls away. By using the Earth as a point of reference, the altitude and movements of the warhead can be computed by simple analysis of image size and motion. From a vantage point 800 miles above the Earth, the space camera photographs more than 4 million square miles of our planet's surface. This mosaic map was made from sequential frames produced by the space camera. From the western coast of Africa, across the South Atlantic, along the eastern shores of South America and North America, then out into the North Atlantic almost to England, the space camera clearly indicated the feasibility of an orbiting weather satellite system. Tyros-1, the first satellite to verify this concept, was launched from Cape Canaveral on the 1st of April, less than a year later. The pillbox-shaped satellite carried two small TV cameras designed to record weather conditions as they circled high over the Earth. From over areas like the coast of French West Africa, over the Baja Peninsula, Gulf of California region, and over the Straits of Gibraltar area, each weather picture was recorded on videotape, then later transmitted to the satellite tracking station at Kaena Point in the state of Hawaii. This experimental nose cone contains 18 different scientific experiments, including three live mice and a camera loaded with color film. In the pre-dawn hours of early morning, the Atlas booster is launched from its Cape Canaveral pad. Moments later, the giant Atlas is seen streaking across the sky with a brilliantly lit moon as a background a pictorial setting for a new space achievement, color from outer space. At a predetermined altitude, the Atlas booster releases its precious cargo. The multicolored stars of the nighttime heavens are seen without the interference of the Earth's atmosphere. Having boosted the nose cone to altitude, the powerful Atlas falls back to Earth, where it will meet a fiery death re-entering the atmosphere. 
The purpose of the color camera was to measure the albedo, or reflecting ability, of the Earth's surface. It was found that the Earth reflects sunlight five times as well as the moon. With a 14 times greater surface area, our planet casts an Earth shine 70 times brighter than moonlight. After completing its flight, the nose cone went through a normal re-entry and was recovered from the sea. All 18 experiments were successful, and the three live mice endured their flight without harm. At Vandenberg Air Force Base's operational proving ground, a giant Atlas missile rises majestically from its protective underground silo. This missile is but one of many launched from the Pacific Missile Range as part of the final phase of weapons system testing. At one point in the development of the Atlas system, minor problems called for a visual record of the engine compartment during two crucial phases of flight, the ignition liftoff phase and the booster staging phase. High-speed motion picture cameras in the red ejectable capsules will photograph the liftoff phase of the flight. These two cameras are turned on just prior to ignition of the three powerful Atlas engines. Each liftoff camera views a different area in the thrust section of the engine compartment. The sustainer engine's liquid oxygen Y duct is the target for one camera, while the second camera views an area adjacent to the Y duct. During the ignition liftoff phase of the flight, these cameras will record any event which occurs within their range. Mainly, they are looking for abnormal occurrences, such as excessive vibrations, hot gas leaks, or small fires. 20 seconds after ignition, when the missile is about 300 feet off the ground, the camera pods are ejected by means of large compressed springs, then fall back to Earth. The powerful Atlas, with two cameras still aboard, continues its fiery journey toward the cold vacuum of space. The two remaining cameras await their assigned task of photographing the booster engine staging phase of the flight. One camera faces aft toward the engine nozzles and the earth. The second camera faces forward toward the top of the missile. At about 50 miles, the staging sequence starts when the two outside booster engines are shut down. Shortly after engine shutdown, the whole bottom section containing the booster engines is jettisoned. The second camera records the booster skirt as it slides off, revealing the upper part of the engine compartment and a small vernier engine. After completion of the staging sequence, the two cameras are released. They re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and are subsequently recovered from the sea. On November 1st, 1963, the first Titan intercontinental ballistic missile ever to carry a space camera was launched on a 5,000 mile flight down the Atlantic Missile Range. The camera it carried was the same highly successful data gathering instrument that proved itself so capable as the Atlas staging camera. staging sequence calls for the firing of the second stage engine before the spent first stage is released. A second camera carrying Titan was launched from Cape Kennedy on the 12th of December 1963. This camera recorded the staging sequence from a different angle. Again, successful use of cameras to record data that would be unobtainable without them. The pace is being kept. Project Mercury, America's first man in space program, 
was thoroughly and most dramatically documented on film. But all the color and glamour didn't overshadow the fact that Project Mercury was the culmination of years of scientific ingenuity and engineering skill. And the engineering touch didn't stop with the launching. All seven astronauts were rated test pilots, engineers in their own right, engineers in search of facts, facts that could be measured and recorded. And of course, cameras have long been one of the primary means of recording data. Each Mercury flight, whether manned or unmanned, carried cameras. Cameras to record clouds, to record the horizon, to record instruments, and even to record the pilot, Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn, during his flight in the Mercury spacecraft Friendship 7. As a test pilot astronaut, he flies his spacecraft, tests its performance in the void of space. He observes the Earth from his 150-mile high orbit and records these observations on film. He tests man's ability to survive and function in this challenging new environment. He eats. He works. And later he prepares for his return. A return which will take him through the Earth's atmosphere at temperatures so extreme that part of his spacecraft will actually burn away as Glenn himself so aptly put it, like a real fireball. A man in space, recorded on film for engineering evaluation and for later use as a dramatic record of man's early space achievements. On an earlier unmanned flight, this view of the Earth was recorded through the periscope in the capsule which carried the chimpanzee Enos. The extreme roundness of the Earth is the result of optical distortion by the periscope. This camera could not be carried on a manned flight as it would obscure the pilot's view through the periscope. Through the window of an even earlier Mercury capsule, we are looking south at a small unnamed tropical storm. But hang on, the giant Atlas booster has been jettisoned and the spacecraft is about to make its 180 degree turnaround. Now we are looking north, where in a very short time we will fly over the eye of a full-blown hurricane. Hurricane Debbie, 350 miles in diameter, with winds up to 120 miles per hour. Debbie is now over the center of the North Atlantic and heading north. Within three days, she will hit the west coast of Ireland with a devastating force, causing extensive property damage and taking 11 lives. As Debbie progresses on her destructive way, we streak toward the dark continent of Africa, where first we see the cloud sheets over the cold waters of her coast, and then the Sahara Desert, hot, dry, and barren. As the United States entered its second decade of space development, Nimbus, a second generation successor to the Tyros weather system, was undergoing final preparations at the Western Test Range. Carrying the most sophisticated camera systems ever flown on a weather satellite, one fully automated Nimbus will do the work of thousands of ground-based weather stations. From its polar orbit, Nimbus will scan the Earth's entire 200 million square mile area every day. Another 10th anniversary event occurred in July of 1964. Ranger 7, America's first successful camera carrying interplanetary voyager was readied at Cape Kennedy. Its destination, the moon. On the morning of July 28th, Ranger 7 left its launch pad. 
68 hours later, Ranger began snapping the clearest, most detailed pictures ever taken of the moon's surface. The field of engineering photography has kept pace. In just a few short years, it has matured from cameras on the ground trying to reach into space to cameras in space photographing the ground. But this is not in itself an end. It is only a milestone. Wherever man may venture, be at the bottom of the ocean or the far-reaching unknowns of outer space, his camera will be among his most valued tools of exploration. As he continues exploring the unknowns of outer space, the animation of today will be replaced by actual photography, just as animation of the Earth has been replaced by the real space films you have just seen. Yes, the field of engineering photography can be proud of its fine record. It has proved itself to be a valuable asset to space age technology.